Hi, this is Livia Mandeli, and this is the audio commentary to the Artists and Wraith issue two. So the cover here is intentionally vague, like most of the covers are, because they come out so far in advance for solicitations that you want them to not spoil the story. But luckily with a story like this, we kind of know roughly who this character is already and what their intentions are. So I just wanted kind of like a violent image of the Artists and Wraith, because we know based on the events of the last issue that introduced the new characters, that they would be kind of going at, after this character in this issue. So the actual uh, story begins here with, I wanted like a bit of like a, a funny kind of comic opening to this where the last one started pretty, pretty serious. There was kind of a ticking clock situation, but this one I wanted something that was funny. So we're introduced to a block class here, which is like a version of the labor class that has a bad life, like so many of them do, where basically his kind exists to have demolition equipment tested on it and just to absorb weaponry tests and that kind of thing. So he's heavily damaged. He's not the brightest. And what he's carrying here is the remains of one of his friends that was also basically bombed and tested into oblivion. So his, his friend is dead, but that doesn't really occur to him. And he still loves him. So he's carrying the remains around with him. And we see that he's not like the brightest robot in the world, uh, which leads us back to the lurk and the resolve from last issue where they turn and talk to another new class of robot called an actuary class. This uh, class is sort of meant to be working in a library, kind of like the Axial or the Artisan class. It's meant to be a, you know, kind of more like sterile environment, intellectual type, but it happens to be a former resolve class here. So it works in a lethal kind of method. I wanted this issue to be the characters we saw from the last issue recruiting new people to go after the Artisan Wraith. So hopefully there's a sense of because these characters are new, you didn't know who would survive. I wanted that that kind of tension going in. And this little, on the next page here, this little exchange between the Resolve and the Actuary class is supposed to set up that the Actuary is physically very weak. So he's like the Artisan, except his specialty is more kind of knives and poisons and that kind of thing. And he's also a desanction Resolve class, because even though we met the Resolve class last issue, I wanted this notion that, because it's such a dangerous sort of murderous profession that if the forgers see anyone kind of acting beyond or even worse than what, you know, they're supposed to be doing like real soldiers, they are either eliminated or they're, you know, booted out of being that class. So the resolve and the lurk have a tendency to, if they're doing a, like a rough mission, they will pay one of these desanctioned agents and they just not tell the forgers that they've hired someone like that, which is kind of what happens in the real world where former soldiers that were extreme become hired mercenaries. And sometimes their involvement in real military actions is not really acknowledged um, this next page here is them reviewing the footage they got from the documentarian in the first issue. So I wanted them to be able to review this footage, but I, I wanted it to be kind of pixelated. I was kind of happy with how this effect turned out of it being this blurry kind of hologram footage of them analyzing, you know, what a wraith actually is like, what is a wraith made out of? And so they have very limited knowledge that very intentionally the wraith are kept mysterious by, by themselves. They don't let their bodies be captured. And the only thing they find is any kind of potential weakness is there's these little kind of fissures in the eyes of a wraith at the corner. That that's the only kind of way kind of inside past the armor. So the actuary class that they meet here um, mentions this poison he got on Rackus, which is the party planet from the, the last issue. His coloring here, too. I wanted this kind of iridescent look. He's supposed to be like he's made of glass. I wanted something suggested that. While he might look kind of imposing, his body is very sort of fragile and light kind of moves through him. And then this next page is the resolve and the lurk kind of filling in to the other members they've recruited that the artisan class are able to see through you and see working components, which if you read the first series, you, you already know that. But the idea is that a lot of robots in this universe don't know that because they'll never encounter an artisan class. They'll never even really see the inner workings of the home world. So that's this other tension I wanted to have where they're going to face not only this really strong body and a mind, but they might be completely visible. All their weaknesses are really visible by this thing as well. And there's no way for them to know until they're actually in a room with it. 
So this next page is them actually arriving on Nalavast, which is the planet of the Artisan Wraith, the planet that he's invited all these Kilox entities to live in under his protection. So I wanted this kind of scary looking community of a lot of Kilox symbols, a lot of heavy weaponry, a lot of kind of bad people we think being brought to this planet. Uh, this notion here, when the actuary talks to Resolve and he says that, you know, your ship has silent engines, I should have put this line and I debated doing it where he said something to her where he was like, you know, I noticed you make almost no noise when you move. Like, do you have silent engines that you've installed inside yourself? And he says something similar here where she sort of cuts him off that, you know, she's constantly modifying and installing like black market weaponry inside herself as this constantly evolving sort of weapon. This next page, when they they land outside of the Artisan Wraith's castle, I wanted a moment where you see the lurk kind of, you know, hinting that he's he's not quite following the mission as closely as he should. He kind of goes off on a little bit of tangent here about another cloaker he knew and also hinting that that cloaker also had memory issues. So that's kind of a recurring theme. But anyway, he cloaks and they enter the castle. The design here of the doorway is meant to be kind of rotting metallic teeth. I wanted a kind of simple but threatening looking entrance. And this is the first time that we really kind of see the artisan wraith, aside from like little tease at the end of the last issue. This is the first time he fully arrives in this this sequel. And then you find out that he can see them. He can see all their weaknesses. Worth noting on the um the second panel on that page there that the block has several red lights that are visible. The resolve has a couple at her joints. And then the actuary class is solid red to indicate that he is completely vulnerable. And the block is the first one to go up. And he's immediately killed by the artisan wraith because he targeted one of the one of the brittle points in general, but especially because of the pressure change arriving from deep space that makes even his body more like brittle than it would have been before. And I wanted this this confrontation between them to be kind of brutal because you know the first issue had a lot of exposition. I wanted a decently long fight scene in this in the second one to really kick things off. We have the notion of the the resolve just unloading ordnance here the actuary throwing darts and hitting perfectly. You know, he true to his word, he has great aim. But the problem is that the type of poison he's using is something that one, the artisan is familiar with and it doesn't work against a wraith. And I wanted the actuary here to die really horribly. So basically what he does is the artisan grabs his wrists and kind of crushes those poison needles into his wrists. So that poison's running through his system. And then the artisan punches him and he explodes. Again, that he's made of glass. So one punch and his entire body just gets decimated. And the, the, this panel here is meant to be like all the glass in him and a couple little machine parts that that's what he's really made of. He doesn't have this kind of endoskeleton the way that a lot of other robots do. Um, kind of darkly funny that his pieces bounce off the resolve here, but I wanted to show also that it's such an icy world they operate in that just seeing that happen doesn't really phase her, that she's sort of seen worse. And then I wanted there to be combat between them, like physical combat, where she's testing out like pressure points, that kind of thing. And then takes a shot to the face by him and is like, you know, you're, you're strong, but your form is really bad. And the artisan is kind of replies, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a nerd. I like science. I work in a lab. I'm not, I've never really thrown a punch really, but I am learning. And so right after he rips one of her arms off completely, which is utilizing the joint that you saw that was red when he looked at her. So he knew like, you know, that's a vulnerability which is also something that she will learn from soon because she will learn that that shouldn't and can't be done again. So next page is like her unloading on him, uh, blasting him. Basically, he's supposed to be being blasted onto the balcony. Like the entire wall was decimated. So he's kind of right above this huge citadel drop below. When she fires at him and he blocks it, he's looking up here. So he's calculating a trajectory of where to kind of bounce her blast off and to bring this stuff down. I had him saying that out loud where he was like, give me a second here, I'm gonna calculate the trajectory. But I thought it was just, it wasn't needed and I wanted this fight scene to be extended without a lot of talking. This next page after is a, a moment I like where he he grabs her arm and he's able to manipulate the joints because he knows how it works. So he's able to pull the wiring make her hand into a fist and then throw it through the clerked lurk where he says here, he's like, you know, who do you think invented cloak technology and why do you think we retired it? The artisans did. And it's like, they didn't retire it because it was causing memories to negate. They didn't care it was doing that. They just retired it because it wasn't entirely accurate. People could see through it, certain people. So then he's kind of revealing more of his plan here where he grabs him by the throat and tells them, you know, he's like, I'm leaving you alive. So there's no real mystery about what happened to your team. You're going to be a warning to the forgers that I'm coming. 
and you know they just sent two of their best and you know you were beaten immediately so they get booted off the castle this line here that you know i have plenty of company already is meant to be what the end of this issue is a little little you know teaser for that but then one final page with the lurk and the resolve where you know i wanted it to be that you know they're injured but they've their entire life is violence and so it's not like they're emotionally devastated by the experience they they know that you know this didn't go well but they also learn from experiences and then i wanted what she sets up here is who she's going to call that realizing that they're not going to be able to physically overtake the artisan wraith so they need to call reinforcements and then going back inside uh the artisan wraith kind of walking to the depths of his castle a couple notes here this background screen says gravity plexus which is something that will be explained later in this in this series also it, it was amusing to me that the beginning of this issue where they find these fissures to think that that's a weakness to you know put poison into the arts and right that's actually how he uses to he uses his fissures to get a drink in that's how he gets buzzed by just pouring something directly onto his face and it seeps in i thought it was funny that what they thought was a weakness is actually just something he uses for for entertainment and then the end here is returning to the kind of dreamscape world which is the characters from the first series seeing them again and it was it was cool to, to for me to work on this because when i started the sequel drawing it it had been quite a while since i saw these original characters you know because most of my initial planning for the sequel was developing the resolve and the lurk and hopefully making them well-rounded and so to kind of get to return to the kid and the wraith and the laborer was was cool because it had been a while for me since i saw them too and then i want to get across this notion that um like uh so the laborer is sort of he's relatively okay for now but the wraith is really sort of you know upset as he does in the first series where he sort of doesn't speak when he's really upset and he's just kind of sitting there like you know mourning and the kid's happy because for the kid the island's pretty great he has his two friends there's no danger he's he's back his body's back in his mind so there's there's really no problem and i wanted this big splash become a melancholy melancholy thing here where the kid is you know trying to comfort the wraith and he's happy but the wraith is obviously horrified by what's by what's happened and then this little uh final two pages here the laborer says to the artisan he's like you know i noticed like you're drinking a good bit which is not what you did before that was something that the laborer did and he's also wearing a cape which is something a kid kind of does so i wanted to hint that you know that there were your t if you do have other robot consciousness that you are living among you will take on some of their traits if you are the 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 driver's seat and that was something i almost put this line into the first series at the end but it was it was too much of a tipping point of where the sequel was going to go so when the artisan black character is dying and he has the kind of mediator class inside of him when he's dying i wanted him to say something to the artisan like you know it's not going to be what you think like he guesses what the artisan's plan is but i felt like that was way too confusing for the first series especially because you don't know what the artisan's plan is until until the end but then this final scene here is pretty big because it shows that the artisan kept the bodies from the first series which is something that he has a, a plan for and hopefully it'll be cool to see them again even if it's you know they don't exactly all look in great shape but little detail here the kid is next to him is the little kind of metal statue sculpture that the wraith was making for him while they were by the campfire there's a notion that to some extent the artisan feels some level of guilt and so he's chosen to bring that thing with him even though it doesn't really it's not really necessary this uh and that's the end of this issue um this cover for next issue is also meant to be vague but it's someone's hand touching a child drawing of the artisan wraith and i wanted it to be you know the kid interprets the artisan wraith as this very loving force even though it should have kind of a sinister connotation if you know what the artisan wraith is and I can say that's a hand of a character we met before from the first series. Pinups this issue. First one is by Josh Burcham, who fellow Transformers artist for IDW. He's working on Beast Wars currently for them. Um, it was really cool that he chose like the to do the kind of dreamscape world. I, I think he looks beautiful colors here. I mean, I love the kind of intergalactic outer space lighting of the artisan's eye there. It's really cool. Uh, Susan Margovich does the next one. She's also a Transformers cover artist and it was really cool i love the way she handled the lurks cloaking where you see the stars through him really cool like that's a that's a really nice effect and the colors are beautiful finally uh, priscilla albano does the final one and i love this piece too of showing the you know the past and future resolve it was it was important to me that we we know who she was before you see this version of her that she doesn't just arrive as this 
you know, unbeatable warrior, even though she kind of gets beaten in this issue, but that you saw that there was kind of a tragic start to her. And now she operates in this underworld. And I think this, this piece really conveys a lot. You know, I think, I think the touching of her chest is, is really great and kind of signals a lot of who she was and who she is now. And that's it for this issue. I also want to thank Brian Ward for producing these commentaries and just helping me a lot in general. So thank you so much. And I will see you next time.